Thank you for having me, Nicole. Let's get started. Go ahead. Got Are about. Yeah, yeah, floor is yours. Go ahead and kick us oh, off. Oh, thank you. Thank all of you who have showed up here today. Today's a very special week for me. I wrote the book in my book called Women, Language, and Power, not so I could sell books, not so I could get people to take my workshop called Women, Language, and Power, but to get into conferences, to literally, as I was doing yesterday, stand in rooms or look at rooms of postage stamp people to talk to women about what I think is one of the most important and one of the most underappreciated barriers to women's advancement in the workforce. And when I first started coaching 15 years ago, I used to think about advancement in terms of career only. But what I mean is what we, uh, the barriers to our advancement, not only in our careers, but in our goals, in our day-to-day -day interactions, in our getting more of what we want, in our getting as far as we want to go. And so thank you for spending the time with me because this is what, um, this is what I spent a lot of time <laughs> writing a book to do. I'm a leadership coach. I work mostly in tech and biotech. I'm a speech coach. So I specialize in communication, both speeches and interpersonal communication. And I'm a clinical psychologist. So when I opened my practice 15 years ago, I got a lot of women who were coming in because they were being told that they needed to improve their communication skills. Or they were coming to me because they knew they needed to be better if they wanted to keep progressing in an organization. Because at a certain point, communication becomes even more important than your competence. And what was amazing was the complaints or the issues that were holding women back were so similar. And they all fall, fell and still fall under the, even more so now, under the rubric of executive presence. So now, interestingly enough, in the field, there's no agreement about what executive presence is. And frankly, managers rarely actually articulate to their direct reports what they mean by executive presence. But essentially, the complaint was the same. Women don't speak up. They're not assertive enough. They're not um, decisive enough. They don't socialize um, with uh, peers and make their teams and themselves visible. They don't self-promote. So over and over and over again, the same complaints about women was going on. And I was just, just, I mean, amazed at how similar it was. And yet I could see over and over again, women making the same mistakes. I could see that the research was what I was experiencing, which is when women are in rooms, particularly with a lot of men, they don't speak as much as men. In fact, I just saw a statistic the other day that a woman, women in rooms of men will speak 75% less than the men, which means you have 75% less visibility on you, on your ideas. I could see that women would hesitate before they would make you know, serious decisions. I could see that they were um, had difficulty self-promoting. So I could see what was being said about them. But what fascinated me was, why is it? that this issue is so prevalent amongst women. Why is it that with executive presence and not having it is that one of the top reasons women get held back? And that's why I spent a couple of years really looking at what the research could tell me that would match my own experience. And so the book I wrote is really about this. Women have been socialized, and I, I believe this through and through now, Women have been socialized from a time that we are little to speak in ways that undermine our power, that doesn't establish our authority. We are reinforced from the time we are little to speak in ways that does not assert our authority, it does not leverage our authority, and it often leaves us, because of the language we've been taught to use really, feeling powerless. So if a girl is told three times more likely than a boy to be quiet and to be nice, it's not that easy for her as an adult to just stand up and command a room. You know what I mean? To stand, to speak up, to be assertive, to be aggressive. All the things that they're being held back for, we've been trained from a young age not to do. 
Quiet and nice is not speaking up. Quiet and nice is not being confrontational. Quiet and nice is not being assertive. Quiet and nice is not asking for what you want. So we're at odds with what our training is when it comes to progressing in organizations. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. One, what it is and where it comes from, a little bit of it, we don't have that much time, and also what you can start doing to be more strategic about the way you speak, to be more effective in corporations in particular that are run by men still largely, and most of the norms for speaking are male. So I want to start with a story that I think will um, make my whole point. I'm a master swimmer. So I um, swim up until COVID, oh, sadly, up until COVID for 14 years. I swim at the same club with the same 21 women and one man um, at the same time. 6.30 in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, okay? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it never changed. We never changed the time. We never changed the date. We never canceled it. We didn't cancel it for holidays. We were there and everybody in the club knew it. So when I started swimming with them early on, I um, noticed there was a man who used to come in at 6 a.m. and he'd get in the pool to swim his laps. And he wasn't a very good swimmer. So when he would hit the wall, he'd sort of just pick his head up, you know, and spin and go. Which meant that he could hear us. That's my point. So um, at six, but at 6.30, he stopped picking his head up and just kept his head down and would spin around, which was a clear ploy not to have his ears available to us, clearly to tell him that it was time to get out. So this irritated me no end because I saw it over and over and over again. And it would cost us minutes. And when you're a swimmer, you don't want to lose any minute of your 60 minutes. So I jumped in the lane next to him. I get right up to the lane line. I wait until his head is pretty close to mine. And I say pretty loudly, I think it's time for us to get in. And he hears me, at least he heard me. And he raises his hand kind of as he's spinning, he like waves and then just keeps going. And so I'm sort of flabbergasted by this. And then and I look up and I see my swim mate is coming. She actually swims in the lane he's in. I think I'm going to see what Tish is going to do here. And so she squats down, waits till his head is close, and says, you're going to get out, right? She's sort of squatting down. You're going to get out, right? She's trying to get his attention and talk to him. Note the words we're using. I say, think. I think it's time to get in. She's asking a question, right? You're going to get out. He keeps going doesn't even bother to raise his hand. So as she goes to get her goggles, some other woman comes, jumps in the side on the other side of him. She again gets up next to the lane and she's literally shaking it to get his attention. And when he lifts his head up, which he did, she says, um, do you know what time it is? Okay, pretty indirect. Do you know what time it is? He says nothing, he keeps going. So at this point, I, we're all now. Kind of. And so I look up at my coach who's on the other side of the pool. She walks, she sees what's going on. She walks over to the kickboard bin, picks up a kickboard, walks over, waits till his head is two inches from the wall and jams the kickboard in. Not meaning to hit him, but to startle him. And it does, you know, he kind of goes up and he puts his feet on the floor of the pool, picks his head up and she says, it's 6.30, we're getting in. And she waves at me to get in the lane, even though I don't swim in the lane. She was signaling like we're getting, literally, you're getting out and we're getting in. And he said nothing and got out of the pool. And for the rest of that hour, I thought, wow, three of us had been polite. What time is it? You're going to get out right. I think it's time for us to get all very polite. My coach, on the other hand, had been just as polite. She wasn't rude. She wasn't mean. She wasn't aggressive. She just was absolutely direct. She was unequivocal about what she wanted to have happen. Like everything about her was like, you know, tone, look in the eye was saying, I mean this. And um, 
she wasn't afraid to do it. She wasn't afraid to leverage her power as a coach or the power of the schedule, which was at 6.30 we swim. So what struck me was that at a moment when we needed to reach for a different style of speaking, to make a different kind of communication, our communication was like, hey, I think it's, and hers was, no, the end, get out, it's our time. So we went at our time when we needed to, because he knew exactly what was going on. It wasn't the first time, it was the fifth time. He knew. And so we needed to do something different. And what I realized is we are not comfortable with that spectrum, sort of that on the, on the spectrum of language, the, the kickboard style, more direct, more authoritative, more, more convicted, you know, with more conviction, not comfortable. And I see that. And so that costs us because when we're trying to get something done, get something done, we use language that isn't really aligned with where we want, what we want. And it has to come not only from the words you speak, but the tone you use and, and, and sort of literally how you hold your body. And so I see this at work all the time. Women get interrupted and they say things like, can I finish my point? Well, that's asking a question. That's a very different communication than saying, I want to finish my point, or I'm going to finish my point. Um, it's one thing to say, um, I need this by Friday. Women will often say, it'd be great if I could get this by Friday. What they mean, what they want, is they want it by Friday. But what they say is it would be great to be, get to me by Friday. Same with asking for promotions. I've demonstrated the skills of a senior director. I want to be promoted or I believe I should be promoted. That's very different from where do you think I fall or I'm hoping I'll be put up for promotion, hoping. So again, what are we doing there? And what we're doing there is we are trained to speak, as I said, in ways that are collaborative, that sound nice, that sound polite, that sound considerate, that sound ways that make people feel good and included. And that costs us when we need to give a different type of communication. And often that's with men, because with men, if they don't hear you say, it's Friday, I need it Friday, they'll go, well, she said it would be great if it was Friday, but she didn't say we had to get it to her on Friday, because they have a very different speaking style. In fact, a funny note, my husband just the other day was swimming in the pool and there was a woman trying to get a man's attention in the lane. So what did he do? He swam to the middle of the lane and grabbed the guy's arm. That, that's what I mean about how different communication style. So what we do is we modify. So instead of saying, it's our time we're getting in, we say, I think it's time to get in. So we put in modifiers, which we're going to talk about. We hedge, we sort of say it, we say, I just want to say, or maybe we should consider all that stuff, which is designed to make people feel more comfortable and to invite them to participate. But in the end, if it's not getting us where we want to go, then we're really paying a big price. And that price is what they're saying will hold us back. Because if what you feel uncomfortable doing is asserting yourself, if what you feel uncomfortable doing is being direct, if what you feel uncomfortable doing is pushing back when someone's taking something that you believe is yours, maybe it's an idea, maybe it's a product, then you're going to pay a price for that. And I've seen, like I say, I've seen it. Okay, so I want to share my screen and show you just a couple things, and then I want to ask you guys, you all a question. And Nicole, you can stop me anytime, by the way. If there's questions or you don't understand something, just stop me. Okay. We have okay. A couple of you can We're see. I'm going to this and then we'll, I'm, I'm monitoring for, our, some, there's some good questions coming up, but you, you keep going. Okay, great. I'm going to share my screen. Nicole, can you see that? I can see it. Yeah, for all of you, my PowerPoint, I'm, this is a keynote in PowerPoint, it kind of wiggles sometimes. Yeah, okay, this is my book right here. 
Now, that's the guy that was swimming. Now, let me catch up. This was my coach, direct, unequivocal, and authoritative. We were polite. So this is my main message to you. We've got to line up our language with what we want. So everything about what you say, your tone, again, your body language, and literal words you use need to communicate exactly what you want to say, which requires, by the way, you knowing exactly what you want to say. And there's so many things that get in the way of that, it's incredible. But okay, so we must align our language with our power. There are three things that I think, again, remember what I said, we're socialized? We're socialized in three ways. Oh, not going to do that yet. Okay, so here's my question. Let's just start here. I want you to think about a time when you really wanted to say something directly, like I did. I wanted to tell that guy, get out, it's our time. But I hesitated. Think about a time when you said something, wanted to say something, but you were afraid. What were you afraid of? That's what I want you to chat in. And I'm going to get rid of this for a second and look at the chat. So if you wouldn't mind, those of you who are here, I would just love to know what makes you hesitate when you want to say something directly. Okay, you might be called aggressive, aggressive, confrontation, that's interesting. Alienating people, mm -hmm. I'll be judged. I'll look competitive. Are there any others? Oh. So all those words you're using there, competitive, aggressive, assertive, making someone uncomfortable, those are all things that we've been socialized not to be. So again, when a little girl's in school, and this is some of the research that I love in my book, is, and she, her, she's building a tower and a boy knocks it down and she says, stop, stop it. The teacher tends to tell her, can you say that nicely? So we are always told to modify what we're saying so we don't sound so aggressive. Boys are not told to say it nicely. They're told to stop screaming, but not to say it nicely. Yeah, so we're very concerned with what being seen in a negative light. And that negative light is very specific, which I want to tell you about. Okay, so let me go back to this. Uh, oh, it's on my slide. Okay, let me go back to this. Thank you for your responses, by the way. Oh, okay. okay, let me put through. One thing you can touch on, I think that someone mentioned in the chat, um, right before this slide, you had the, um, like, as you're talking through, is around the power, where, where your authority lies. I don't know the words you used, Susanna, but someone po pointed out in the chat, and I think it's particularly important for this group, is product managers many times have to lead without authority. Yes. So I think that is where, and someone also mentioned talking with an engineer, like maybe I'm not technical enough. So many times we have to assert where we might not be the expert or where we're not the, I need it by Friday. And so yes. I think thinking about how we do that as product leaders um, will be an interesting take. Yeah, you guys have superpower skills of <laughs> getting people to do things without authority. It's why women are so good in your role because that's what we're so good at is helping people collaborate, come together, agree, all of that. There are times, though, when you can have an opinion but still invite participation. So you may not be the authority, but you have an opinion, and you may not be 100% certain or educated on the topic. It doesn't mean you can't have an opinion and also invite someone else's. So I think you'll see that when we get into that, but it's an interesting right. dilemma. Okay, there are three ways women are conditioned to undermine their own authority and power. One is we are taught to consider others all the time before, consider others' needs before our own. So as I'm thinking about what I want, I'm also considering what my peers might want or what that might mean to my boss if I, 
you know, push for a promotion where I shouldn't, or if I, you know, so we are always managing our needs in relationship to others' needs. Not true of men so much. They're thinking about what they want. They're not thinking about what that means in the larger context. And that holds us back sometimes. Contained, we're socialized to contain our bodies and our voices. So literally to make ourselves small, girls are taught to sit in small spaces and play quietly, not take up space, and not to use our voices in ways that command a certain um, attention and volume. We're also taught to speak, literally speak in ways that creates collaboration. That's why we're so good at it, at what we just talked about. But that doesn't always set up a sense of authority or conviction. So one of the reasons we're so afraid of being seen as aggressive, you know, bossy, bitchy, um, too assertive, harsh, all those words that we use, some of which were in the chat, is because gender norms, there's a good study called the BEM Sexual Inventory, and it's a collection of characteristics that are socially desirable for both men and for women. And I want to show you what the BEM Sexual Inventory shows as desirable characteristics for women. Now, this was about 20 years ago. Okay, I mean, some of these are just freaking awful, flatterable, childlike, gullible. Those might not be still true. But I can imagine you can find one or two or three characteristics here that in 2022 are still being reinforced by society and that we still feel obligated to demonstrate. So if somebody else is Allow, interrupts and starts talking over us, what do we feel? We, we don't want to sound like we're complaining. We don't want, you know, or our coworker wants to do the presentation instead of us. So we don't want to sound like we're, we're un, you know, not understanding of what their needs are or soft-spoken. So we don't want, these are the things that we are judged by. These are the gender norms that we are judged by. And they shape the way we speak and they limit us. Because if you look at men's, which is on the right-hand side, dominant characteristics, they're all about the individual being decisive, being ambitious, being assertive. Look at the women's characteristics. This was a current study. Sensitive, collaborative, loyal, soft-spoken. So in male organizations where the norms are male, we're using a language that really doesn't fit or get us where we want to go. So I want to talk just a minute about this, contain, and then I want to get on to the language because we have a worksheet about that. We're contained to condition to make our bodies small. We're told stay in small spaces, do things in the small area of the playground, play in hush tones, less volume. Boys are allowed to use up space, use volume. So over time in school, Girls learn that they should wait their turn and speak quite quietly and nicely. Boys learn they have. Now, why does that matter? Well, literally, in terms of body language, using up space actually makes people perceive you as more confident. So when women stand up and they're told you're supposed to command the room, they've been taught to say like this, not to get up and, you know, take over a room. All of that is our conditioning <clears throat> against us. Quiet and nice, quiet and nice. So those of you parents out there, it's interesting to watch your own reactions to your girls versus your boys in terms of this. This is a result of being told as girls to be quiet and nice. As adults, Harvard graduate students. Okay, we're taught when we're young, girls, little girls play with little girls and we're taught to speak in ways that, as I said, keep everybody feeling comfortable and collaborative. We're working together. Boys are taught hierarchy. Who's on top? Who's on the bottom? How can I establish myself in the hierarchy? Two very different speaking styles. Uh, 
I'll tell you what, when remember I said we take assertions and then we modify them, these are some of the common ways women modify assertions so that they sound more collaborative, they sound more polite, they sound more understanding, they sound like they're inviting participation. One is that we hedge. That's me saying, I think it's time to get out. I knew darn well it was time for him to get out. I hedged. My girlfriend, she tagged a question. You, it's time that you're going to get out, right? That's a question. The statement was, you need to get out. Intensifying. So we'll tend to like say, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have to ask you to get out. You know, sorry. I know you want to swim. We just didn't overdo. And it makes us sound like we're not confident about what we're saying. Qualifying is when you undermine your sentence before you even say it. So you say things like, I'm not sure. Um, I know what the schedule says, but I think it's time for you to get out. Mm -hmm. the, I'm not sure what the schedule says, just undermined everything. And then we often apologize, not because we think what we did was wrong, but because we're just trying to smooth over the interaction. So these are just a few of the common ways we modify. And so again, how it's heard by our audience is they don't get the communication that I want you to get out. They get the other sort of diluted communication. I'll show you, Here's, these are just examples of what I just said. <laughs> yeah. So for example, here, these are all from my clients. And believe me, this isn't just, you know, lower level people. This is all the way up to the C-suite that I'm working with women to change their language and really learn how to speak their truth, so to speak, um, in clear and direct ways when they need to. You can always toggle between the more effective language and the more collaborative, the more direct language and the more collaborative. Okay, so how would we change this? I just want you to think about it since we don't really, yeah. Or does anybody want to unmute? I don't know how many people are yeah. holding. Uh, we can have folks can can bring themselves, share their screen and, and their sound, and I can bring them up on the stage. Okay, good. I'm just curious, after what I just said, hedging, qualifying, apologizing, where would you say this statement has been watered down? What What's the modifiers here? Who'd be willing? Does somebody want to come on yeah, stage? We have someone here. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I think the statement is st starting with a sorry, uh, apologetic way to begin with. I would now not start with that. And I would say it makes more sense to do a newsletter instead of a blog. Yeah, great. Because I'm wondering as a tagging question, it yeah. makes more sense. And then we'd either, if you were me, if you were, you were my client, I'd say, okay, do you want to say it makes more sense? Or do you want to qualify that? Do you know what I mean? You need to be even more specific. Great, exactly. Exactly right. Thank you for the comment. Here's another one. This was from a client whose boss came to talk to her team and it was an awful experience. He was dismissive. He was sort of critical of their work. She got a lot of upset emails. How has this been modified? From what you can imagine, she wants to say to him. Now it's her boss, so she has to be careful. Anyone want to come up? Or I need someone to come up. Look, I'm already practicing it. <laughs> There's somebody in the group who has an hand ready. <laughs> oh, do it. Um, you know that whole sentence where I she, she, it's starting with "I'm not sure that went well." Uh, itself is qualifying that you are not sure of what you are saying. So I think I would rather say that I think it did not. Um, I would say. I think it did not go well uh, because I'm getting a lot of upset email with a lot of upset people, you know, so really nice. I would qualify in a positive way saying that I think that did not go well because I'm getting a lot of emails from a lot of upset people, you know? Yeah. I really like how you're tying the two together. You're not just, you know, I didn't think that went well. I don't didn't think that because of these emails. Yeah. Now, if you're afraid to make that kind of a strong statement, <laughs> just start with, I got a lot of emails. And that, yeah, and it's telling me didn't go well. Yeah. Good. Thank you. We'll do one more. Oh, no, we well, know that one. Okay. You're just here. You're, you, you're expert. I'm sorry? 
I said, we can just keep Emery in here if she wants to do one more. Ah, I would on. love to. I, Susanna, your your words are so helping me. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> okay, look. What are the two things in here? There's one I really don't like, and it's now become very common. What do you think? David knows way more than I do about this. Oh, I don't like this. Yeah. Why would David know more than I do? I know more than what David knows. So, <laughs> but I just want to say, I think we should accept. Uh, yeah. No. So first I would not put David into the picture. Exactly. I would say, I think we should extend the deadline because we are not going to achieve the targets. Exactly. Why do I have to compare with the David inside the room? And why do I have to compare my knowledge with the David inside the room? You know, so now David may know more. In fact, I, this was on an interview. Who cares? With, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this was on an interview on um, NPR, and they asked her the question, and then she said, "David may know more." And I'm thinking, they didn't. They David may know more, but they were asking you exactly. And, they, and then there's this little. I just want to say, remove that from your language also, because just means just this little thing. I want to say, you know what I mean? It's not that important. I just want to say. Yeah. Okay. So I love structures and, and I love um, to think about, ha have to help women because it's so habitual for us to put this stuff in. You know, it's so come so fast. And so what I say to women is you need to prepare and practice when you know you're going in to say something that might be difficult because very quickly, you, this, this is pretty obvious, but very quickly you'll put those modifiers in. And if you don't want them in there, because they are useful at times. You want to do something different. So here's a nice little format to think about. Now, you have a worksheet that we sent you that has this on it. So here's how it goes. You start with your headline. So if there's something you realize you want to talk about or an assertion you want to make about um, the upcoming roadmap that, you know, that you're unhappy with, you don't think it's substantial enough or whatever it is. What is that headline? What is that short positional statement that represents the unmodified, now you may modify at some point, but the unmodified opinion you have. What is that headline? That's the first thing you want to write down. Then you go ahead and explain it. This is good for anybody. This is just good communication. Then you explain it. What's the rationale for that position? And then you support it with data, with your experience. You know, women get accused all the time of saying that they rely on they, their feelings for things. So you really want to bring into it anything that you can that will support this. So this is just a very clear structure for one, preserving the headline so that people hear it first. Women are also, the research shows, we tend to say, um, 30 seconds worth of sentences before we get to our main message. And that's often because we're kind of uncomfortable just being that direct. So what we have to know for ourselves is what's the headline, what's the explain, what's our support. And then if you want to modify or add something to it that's going from being more direct to less direct, you might add, I'm curious about your opinion. You know what I mean? But what you don't want to say is, I'm wondering if you think what I think, which is that we should do X, Y, and Z. Go, no. What I think is this. If you want to invite participation in that, you can. So let me give you an example. Okay. Now, you could flip this structure. You could start with Bob's counterpart. Bob's counterpart was given a raise three months ago. And we might lose him if we don't respond to his request for a raise. That's all the support. Next, headline. This is the she, S-H-E. Headline. So we need to make an exception and give him a salary increase. He's been promised a raise for six months. So you can move this around, but my point here is what gives people confidence, whether it's a man or woman, it doesn't matter who it is, is to have a good structure to what you're going to say. 
And for those of us who struggled for some, to some extent of not being as direct or not um, leveraging a sense of conviction and authority, it's really good to write out. I talk a lot about this in my book, write out the script and then practice it and then get feedback on it. So like you're going into a performance review or you're going into, you know, counter, um, you know, some agreement that's been made. You really want to have practiced this because it can get dicey for us when we get pushed up against sounding like we're, um, we, we get anxious ourselves about sounding too aggressive, too assertive. And so we'll modify. So I'm curious right here. Now I'm gonna if anyone would be willing to unmute. So this is this is for you. I have, I have one more person who's ready. Yeah. I three. Not sure what this is what you raised your hand for, but we're pulling you up. You were in the moderation queue. There you hey. go. Oh sorry about that. I was just um I didn't realize I, you know the button but happy to be here yeah um i put this in the in my comments um one of the things that was also mentioned to me in the past was to avoid um prefixing my opinions with i think because it it sounds tentative um and again it also falls into the list of things where people say women are they give their feelings a lot more value than the truth so uh, prefixing it instead with i believe this is how this is what it is um is i uh, has been mentioned to me as a better way and i've actually honestly also seen people respond to i believe a lot better than i think because when i say i think um i've seen people just listen to that and then just move on when i say i believe it gives my comments a little more gravitas where people have to wait and think because um it just it just comes a little more comes across as, as a little more assertive okay and what if you remove both of them, either one of them? Um, even better. Uh, even I'll better. tell you. Um, one of the things is um, we I tend to use filler. We tend to use filler words quite I, a bit. I hear what you're saying about think or believe. I kind of like believe better when I, you know, people often ask me about think. Anything that becomes habitual becomes um, uh, ineffective. So if you always say I think, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There are times to not say a thing. To just say we need to make an exception. Now you'd have to figure out when when you want to do either. But you don't want to have anything be a habit, because one, it can annoy people. They 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 hear the vocal pattern, but for the most part, it's not very. Because there are times to say, look, I believe this is the most important thing for us to do, and that word, as you say, gives some punch to what's coming behind it. But if you use it every time, that's it's not as effective. Yeah, completely agree with you, Susanna. And I just also want to reinforce what you said earlier. I was one of the people that would just start with, I'm sorry. Um, I, yeah, whenever I would just want to get into a conversation, I would always apologize for interrupting. And then I would just get into the conversation uh, versus I've seen men that would just take over the conversation and then never apologize. Yeah. Um, it's I've seen that happen so many times. Um, it used to really upset me that people would not consider me nice. Um, and I completely again agree with you. I've been told that I should be nice. I've been told that I they um, moved my meeting to Friday. Yeah, I've been told that I sh I am a little aggressive and I should actually tone it down. Um, and that's what made me you know really hold back on conversations where everybody thinks that as a woman, you're supposed to be nice and there will be 10 other guys in the conversation that would speak over you and nobody thinks that's rude at all. Yeah. And that's for women. Yeah. And then that's just for women. Like you say, what we expect women to be. And then there's the cultural overlay of what we think black women or Asian women or, you know, middle um, Eastern European women or, you know, Indian women, what they should be. So we're trying to manage all kind of biases about what we should be. And we make people uncomfortable when we step outside of those boundaries. So I, and there's a price to be paid. Believe me, I've helped, um, very, when I was early on in my career, I helped a woman who was SVP to try, who was BP trying to get up to SVP. And I really coached her to be much more assertive with her boss, who was very being very cagey about her promotion. And she pushed, and then they fired her. 
I mean, they didn't fire her. They managed her out. But there is a price to pay. So I call it threading the needle of don't give up your aggressiveness, but you may want to, because what's wrong with aggression? I mean, it's healthy. Yeah. There is, but you may want to marry it with something that's got a little more collaborative tone to it. That's what they say the most successful women do is toggle back and forth between that more collaborative language and the more authoritative language. So you want to come forward with a position and then you might want to say, um, maybe you have, you know, invite participation or I'm open to other ideas or, but we don't want to lose the core of what we're saying because that's who we are. This is, this is what upsets me the very most. I'm going to, um, I'm going to time check too, Susanna. We've got about three minutes left. So I don't know if we, we have a, we probably can have time for a couple questions. We have a couple folks lined up. Can, can, you can, you can um, close on, you can do your, your wrap up point uh, and then make a couple questions. Uh, oh, and also Andrea, there's a side chat going on here. Andrea has, has, is creating a group that's going to practice this language together. She shared her LinkedIn is going to create a little group. So excellent. that is excellent. The best. Oh, this one. There's a book. Nicole, mm -hmm. can, can I ask you a question, Susanna, before I lose you? You don't have to ask. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, Susanna, this is so true what Gayatri just mentioned, that as women, we have to work twice as hard to prove ourselves equal to the men on the table. And then I'm I'm a very assertive and a, kind of an aggressive, passionate person about my work. And most of the times I'm considered to be very bossy, bitchy or uh, rude when I'm just saying that, hey, this is how I want it to be. So how do you tread that fine line uh, between being called too aggressive to actually being more assertive and, you know, be taken comparative to the, the fellow men on the table? How do you, how do you create that balance? Yeah, like I say, you got to marry the style of language you use. So you say, look, this is what I want. Now, if, if you're telling me that's too hard for you, I'm open to that. If you're, if that, is that made, you know, that's my request. Is that, then you, then you inquire. Is that something that's going to be hard? I mean, you've got to, you've got to do a little bit of both where it's not just that cold so question of what I want. You got to then wrap the more collaborative languaging around that. But don't give up. That. I mean, we seem to hear some. You're from. I don't know. your side. Can you please mute yourself? Nope. Oh, sorry. I went ahead. There you go. I think. Yeah. We. She's still on. She's still here. We just muted her. She had some background noise. I love that. Um, that there. Yeah. Okay. So I answered that question. It is the marriage of the two styles. So stick with what's true for you your direct statements, but then use language that invites participation or, um, you know, says, you know, that's my opinion. You may have a different opinion. That's, that's not being too cold hearted or bitchy. Yeah. Um, and I have one more thing to add to that, Susanna. So, um, I've heard both sides of the you know argument where uh, initially I was told I was too aggressive. I speak up too much. I should, you know, try to not intimidate others. I'm too bossy. Um, and then uh, I was told that um, to grow into a leadership role, I should be a little more, uh, um, I should help encourage others and be a little more accommodating. And then when I toned it down or like intentionally pulled back, um, the next cycle I got the review that I don't speak up enough in conversations, that I should be a little more assertive and I should make my opinions heard. Yeah. So people are just going to, it's, it, I, I just realized that it's, it's a battle I will ne not win. Um, so just be true to yourself. I completely agree with your statement where you just be yourself and let people define you any which way, they, um, or rather let people talk to you. But one thing I was told is not to define myself with negatives where I tend to go in and say, I'm sorry if I'm being a little bossy. So don't do that to yourself. Don't be sorry. Don't apologize for who That's you are. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that was the democratic debates, you know, when Elizabeth Warren said, they said, what, what's a gift? What, what's something you want to apologize for? And she said, I know I get hot under the collar. You know, and I thought, well, everybody gets hot under the collar in these. Yes, there's no winning. And frankly, this is not competence. You know, this is window dressing to me. 
And the key things that you should, your career should depend on are your competence. But you do have to put some effort into this because it is, again, what they point to for why women shouldn't be progressing. Yeah. And they will ask that to a man. Are you sorry about something? No. <laughs> so um, is it time for me to close? Yeah, I was going to say thanks, Guy Three, for uh, for your questions. We have we have one more. But we're we're right at time. I don't know if you want to take one more question or you want to wrap. We can take one more question, um, and then we'll wrap from there. Um, bringing on, let's see if she's coming. I press plus. Oh, she's not there. Let's see, something glitched. Cynthia, maybe here. If it's because it's after the time. Maybe they raised their hand and then they raised them down because I'm trying to pull them up and they're not coming. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap from here. Um, Susanna, do you want to wrap up? I do. I just want to say, you know, when I think about the three C's, which I spent a lot of time with, we consider others' needs before ourselves. We are taught to contain our voices and our bodies. We are taught to speak in tones that are collaborative and nice, all of that. All of that in some ways takes us away from knowing who we are and what we want and what we think. Because what I think always has to be compared to what will my what I think do to that person, or I don't want to be that, then where is the core of me? And this is what I feel we've been robbed of. We've been robbed of the, the ability to just own our own authentic voice and not have to constantly modify it. So the better you can get at threading that needle and preserving your own thinking, it is so important. And if you like what I'm talking about today, like me on LinkedIn. That's my biggest platform. And um, thank you for coming. It just makes my day to have the opportunity to discuss this with all of you. Thank you, Susanna. You've got a lot of great comments and energy in the chat. I think you've really um, reinvigorated this group. So it's it's super exciting to see. Everyone, don't forget to also review this session. And thank you, Susanna, for an amazing workshop. Yes, thank you. And join that group that somebody was setting up. I know. It's very exciting. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Okay. Bye, everyone. Have a good day.